and this is one of our high redshift universe images of the uh, distant galaxies. It's basically the Hubble Ultra Deep Field version 3.5 or something like that. Okay? Um, if you didn't get one, get one after the lecture. Our speaker tonight is Mia Bowles. She is talking about the Southern Skies Astronomy in Chile. All right, uh, and coming up we have uh, next month, March 1st, John Debs will be talking about planetary tales from the stellar crypt, exoplanets surviving the death of their host star. So the idea that when a star dies, could the planet still be around? Yes, he will tell you all about those morbid tales next month. Uh, in April, Rachel Austin will be here and tell us why we need to understand uh, stars to find the next Earth, because the formation of stars and planets are intricately, intricately connected. So understanding one and understanding the other are actually trying to understand both at the same time. In May, Tom Brown, a gentleman who I, I guilted into coming back because he's a really good speaker, but he hadn't given a talk here in about a decade. Um, and I was able to get him to come back and talk about ultra faint dwarf galaxies, which he gave me a really long title. <coughs> On the Trail of the Missing Galaxies, the Oldest Stars in the Neighborhood. Okay, so these are the ultra faint dwarf galaxies. He'll be telling us about those in May. If you would like to figure out, uh, oh, wait a minute, um, and about these upcoming talks, you <coughs> have an extremely important note. Now, how many people saw the road signs on the way here saying that San Martin Drive will be closed on or about uh, uh, February 12th? Yes, it, San Martin Drive, part of it will be closed. So south of the space of the Institute will be closed. So if you are going to come to next month and for the next like five or six months, I think it's through September, uh, you will have to approach from the north, which is from University Parkway. If you try and approach from Wyman Park Drive and south, you won't be able to get here. It will be closed, okay? So make note and next month remember, or tie a little string around your fingers so you remember to come from the north. All right. so. Furthermore, if you want more information, you go to our website, which has been slightly revamped. I don't know if you, how, how many of you paid close attention to my, my slides, my opening slides, but this is slightly revamped because we have um, our, our, our page where we have our upcoming talks. These are uh, upcoming talks. We've also got links to the live, um, the YouTube event and the uh, STSCI webcasting. We've got the archives, the links for the archives put up much easier to find now, okay? You don't have to go one way or the other. You can find the, both YouTube and the STI webcasting. And if you would like to sign up for our email list, instead of having to do multiple steps with mail list.stsai.edu, we actually have a nice little box here where you can subscribe or unsubscribe right there. Okay, so hey, we did something in January. We revamped our webpage a little bit. Uh, all that information is there. Uh, to find it, just search Hubble Public Talks and you will find us or we have this go link, hubblesite.org, go talks. All right, if you would like announcements, I just showed you how to sign up for the announcements list. If you want to do it the more difficult way, you can also go to maillist.sdsci.edu. The uh, mail list is called Public Lecture Announce, um, or just provide your email address. If you still want to go analog, you can write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me and hope that I remember when I get in tomorrow to add you to the mail list, okay? Uh, it hasn't always worked. I will be honest with you that sometimes those pieces of paper don't always make it through. But fortunately, those people have come back to me and said, come on, Frank, and I've gotten it the next time. All right, uh, if you would also like to make any comments, you can uh, send things to public lecture at stsci.edu. Uh, comments, questions, <coughs> sign for announcements, yet again, another way to do that. Okay, if you'd like to follow us on social media, Hubble is on Facebook. We've got one, not one, but two Twitter accounts. Um, we're on Google Plus, and we're on Pinterest, and we may be on other things that I don't know about. Uh, myself, I have my blog on Hubble site and Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter that I use sparingly, okay? So uh, don't expect you're gonna get lots of information if you try to follow me. I will post at most once a day. Okay, all right. 
Uh, the weather has not permitted us to open up the observatory to across the street, or actually permitted the Maryland Space Grand Observatory <laughs> folks. Uh, Duncan sent me an email and said, it looks cloudy. And I looked before I came in, and it really is cloudy. So, so no observatory tonight, but go to md.spacegrant.org, and you will find out when they have their other uh, open nights, which I believe is every Friday. So you can see, um, go and look through their observe telescope there. All right. Now we have our news from the universe for February 2016. And because it is a special day, you get Groundhog Day, Carina Nebula edition. Now, what am I referring to? I'm referring to the film starring Bill Murray and Andy McDowell from about 20 years ago. Uh, in which Bill Murray is stuck reliving the same day over and over. And that day, of course, happens to be Groundhog Day. And he lives the th and it's a wonderful, I find it a very, very funny, a wonderful expression of life uh, and the, the patterns of life that repeat. And he gets to live the same day over and over again. And it features the only scene, cinematic scene I know of a groundhog driving, okay? <laughs> Not only does he see his shadow, he sees the shadow of death in this scene, if you know the movie. All right, so we are going to do our own Groundhog Day version where we're gonna do something over and over again with the Carina Nebula, all right? So this is a ground-based image of the Carina Nebula from the Anglo-Australian Observatory, and you can see the full scale of the Carina Nebula. It's a star-forming region. Uh, Hubble did a very large mosaic <coughs> right here in this region of the, uh, of the Carina Nebula. And if I go in and I show you, these are all the footprints of the Hubble observations of the Carina Nebula, okay? And you can see there's like 40 different observations taken with Hubble. And I don't know if you guys recognize that, you know, it's, it's hard enough just to get one or two or three observations, but 40 observations, okay? That's a lot of Hubble time, okay? So this, this was a, a significant chunk of Hubble observing time. And when you process that data, put it all together, you get an amazing image. This is the Carina Nebula mosaic, okay? Um, and uh, it was released in April 2007. And you'll note here it's 29,000 by 14,000. It is 400 megapixels of Carina Nebula goodness here, okay? And it just is one thing that I've noticed is that we, we can really milk uh, the Carina Nebula for all sorts of really interesting images. So this is the biggest, one of the biggest images we've ever released into the Carina Nebula, but it actually contains a lot of other images that we've also released, okay? So we'll start right here. That object right there is Ada Carr. Um, and Ada Carr, uh, we've been observing since the 1990s. It is a supermassive star. It's about 150 solar masses. Um, and this is one of the uh, stars that we believe will, will explode in the next few million years. Okay, It's one of the stars that has this uh, a tremendous outburst of, of material that uh, was believed to have been thrown out in the 1840s, all right? Uh, it had tremendous brightening and, and, and dimming, I'll show you that a little bit later, uh, of Eta Car. So Eta Car is one of the highlights of the Carina Nebula. Uh, but if we also look here, in this region here, um, in 2000, we released this image of that region of, of the Carina Nebula, uh, in which, where we've got this beautiful, um, bright uh, striation of, of gas here, as well as this dark gas here that's being eaten away. Uh, the, the wonderful colors in what is uh, sometimes called a keyhole nebula, as well as being called Carina. <coughs> and then if you look up here in this region here, in 2003, I believe it was, we released this image of these dust clouds. These dust clouds, this is actually dust in the wind, dust that's being pushed away by the wind from, a, from Ada Carr. The wind from Ada Carr is actually pushing, and, and so there is a dust flowing through the gas. Uh, that was one of our Hubble Heritage releases in 2003. Uh, and then this region over here got the royal treatment in 2010 because it was our 20th anniversary image, which we called Mystic Mountain, all right? And uh, this is an inc incredible image uh, that we released for Hubble's 20th anniversary. And uh, if we zoom in on that, you can see that it's got incredible sculpting of the high energy radiation from newborn stars eating away at the gas, creating this beautiful, gorgeous mountain-like features. 
as well as because we had installed wide field planetary wide field camera three by this then we observed it not only in visible light we observed it in infrared okay taking a look at it getting various views of the Carina nebula but yet we still have more to look at in the Carina nebula because uh, later in 2010 we released this image of the regions of all these dark pillars uh, in the Carina nebula whereas these dark gas uh, jets dark dark gas clouds on the edge of the, the bubble that is being evacuated by a hot star cluster and finally after we've gone back to the Carina Nebula and back to the Carina Nebula and back to the Carina Nebula, this month, what do you think we did? We went back one more time and we got a picture of that star cluster that is actually doing a lot of this uh, ionizing radiation. Here is Trumpler 14, which is the star cluster in the one, one, of, the, one of the big star clusters in the core of the Carina Nebula that's actually ionizing a lot of this radiation. And let me actually zoom in on this a little bit so you can see it in great detail. This reminds me a bit of the uh, 25th anniversary image of uh, the star cluster Westerlund 2. Uh, this is another one of our Hubble Heritage images that goes in and finds the prettiest pictures that we've got. But uh, what I love, love about this is that it really shows you that high energy radiation, but it also has this sort of jelly, jellyfish looking like thing, okay, or squid looking like thing. That is yet another one of those dark dust clouds that is seen in silhouette uh, against the brighter background, okay? So even though you've got what looks like tremendous amounts of energy going on here, yet you still have this dark dust cloud here hanging in here. Um, it, it makes for quite an interesting feature within the star cloud. So like Groundhog Day, the movie, we are able to go back to the Carina Nebula back over and over again, but at least every time we go back, we get a gorgeous, pretty picture to show you. And maybe there will still be more in the future uh, looking at the Carina Nebula. All right, our second story tonight, we're going to continue the Groundhog Day theme and that we're going to still go back uh, and we're going to hit the Ada Carr quintuplets. All right, we're going to go back to the uh, Carina Nebula and Ada Carina. All right, and I talked about this being a 150 solar mass star. Um, and then it has this huge blowout of gas called the homunculus. All right? And um, what, what was really cool about Eta Carr is to look at its historical brightness. So here is a curve uh, where we've got time on the x-axis and the brightness of Eta Carr on the, on the y-axis. And you can see back in the 1840s, it had a huge outburst where it was one of the brightest stars in the night sky. Okay. Eta Carr was one of the brightest stars in the night sky at that time, and then it quickly faded. And right here is magnitude 6, which is a roughly human eye limit, so it dropped below the visibility of the human eye. Go in from as bright as Sirius, basically almost as bright as Sirius, to um, something that the human eye couldn't see. All right, that's over a factor of hundred, uh, about, about several hundred uh, thousand um, in terms of brightness that it faded. And then, as we approach today, it's been rising back up, and it's now in between magnitude four and five. All right, so what's going on here? Well, we have studied Eta Carr with Hubble, not just by imaging, but also by spectra in terms of the outburst and when the, when the flow out of it. It is a, super ma is a very massive star that is, we expect will go supernova, that will explode um, uh, within the next few million years. Okay? And we believe that during that outburst in the 1840s, that gas was blown out and blocked the light of the star. Okay? It had an out, in having the outburst, it brightened up really, really bright, and then the gas that came out has blocked it. Okay? And now it's beginning to brighten again. So this is a really cool, uh, really cool object to study. Now, unfortunately, astronomers have yet to find any other objects like Eta Carr. It is the brightest, the most massive star around in our galaxy around us. We know of no other star inside our galaxy that is like Eta Carr. And you can't really make um, strong conclusions unless you have a category in which to study. So what do you do? Well, you go find some beautiful galaxies like the Whirlpool Galaxy, Messier 51, 
and then Messier 101 or NGC 6946 or Messier 83. And you bring together those gorgeous galaxies and you say, let's go look inside those gorgeous galaxies because they're the prettiest galaxies. They should have some, some one pretty stars to look at, right? No, uh, they are pretty galaxies because they are face on galaxies. All right, and because they are face on, it means we can see the stars inside them much better than if they were edge on, for example, right? Okay, so we study the pretty galaxies because they're face on so that we can look in detail to try and find the stars we're looking for. And in these four galaxies, we're able to find five objects that resembled Eta Car. Okay, so we can't find in our own galaxy stars like Eta Car, but we can find them uh, in other galaxies. And here is what they look like. <laughs> yeah, little dots. Okay, the cutting edge of science is always, at least the cutting edge of astronomy is almost always done with fuzzy dots or squiggles, okay? All right, fuzzy dots and squiggles, that's what research astronomers deal with, okay? This is the, our fuzzy dot uh, version of it, okay? Um, and we, on the top row, we have the Spitzer observations of these five objects. And the bottom row, we have the Hubble observations of these five objects. Now, can we see them in the detail we see Eta Car? Of course not. We can't see homunculuses around them. But we can tell because we know the distances to the galaxies, the brightnesses of these stars. And in particular, by having Spitzer and Hubble observations, we can look at the ratio of the infrared to visible light emission from these stars. Now, you'll notice that they call them Eta Twins, OK? And hence, I call this the Eta Quintuplets, right? I have a little problem with them calling them twins, okay? Because we don't see them in anywhere near the detail, okay? They're spectroscopically similar. Maybe you'll call them Eta Car analogs, but I have a little problem calling them twins because we don't truly know that these are 150 solar mass stars, okay? Um, that's just one little nitpicky thing, one astronomer to another. But we now have a category, a, a class of objects that we can start to study to see if they have common characteristics to learn more about these very rare stars. All right? And it takes the resolution of Hubble and the ability of having two, the great observatories both in visible light and in infrared light to be able to do these type of observations. Okay. All right, Groundhog Day is over. We are done with the Carina Nebula. And now we go to our featured speaker. Um, our speaker tonight is Mia Bowell. She got her um, degrees from the University of Maryland uh, and then spent one year in the University of uh, Texas, uh, Austin, UT Austin, and then three years down in Chile, which is something you'll be hearing about tonight, um, on a, I guess it's the equivalent of an NSF fellowship down in Chile, right? Okay. I'm, I'm just going to say uh, the equivalent of an NSF fellowship. <laughs> she only came to the Space Telescope Science Institute in October of, la of last year. So she's less than six months here. Uh, she, still, she still has to uh, has trouble finding some of the meeting rooms, which we like to hide in the, in the dark corners of this building. So make her feel welcome. Give her a big hand. Ladies and gentlemen, Mia Bohol. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to be talking to you about the southern skies, um, specifically about astronomy in Chile, not so much as the science, but in terms of a field. Um, this picture is actually looking off the end of the American continent. This is the Strait of Magellan, looking towards Tierra del Fuego. Within 10 years, 70% of the ground-based astronomical infrastructure in the world will be on Chilean soil. 
And a large chunk of that is because of this, not this exact location in the Atacama, but because of the Atacama. This is the best location in the world to build telescopes. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that, in a, about why, in a moment. However, before, I thought I'd give you a brief background into Chile. So we all know the running joke about the American sense of geography. You have the, Amer the US, you have Canada, lots of ice hockey up here, I hear. You have tequila, tea, old buildings, communists, and dragons. And in Australia, apparently, you have something else, because I hear they actually have dragons there. So, so I'm assuming that everyone in this room has a slightly better sense. Oh, yeah, and don't forget Santa up here. And apparently, there's no cold down here. Antarctica has melted due to global warming. So, however, this is from a webcomic called XKCD, where they attempted to draw a slightly better map of the world, where there are luckily no dragons. However, even on the slightly better map of the world, where they even call themselves on how little they know Africa, you have Brazil. They know there's somewhere here that speaks French or English. But somehow they have lumped, you have Mexico, Central America, and then all of Spanish-speaking South America. Somehow Tierra del Fuego got labeled. I don't quite know how that happened. But I know several Chileans that would absolutely be apop apoplectic about the fact that they and Argentina are shaded the same color on this. <laughs> so therefore, I thought it would be good if we maybe did a brief overview of exactly where Chile is. This is an actual correct map of, of South America. Here we have Argentina, Brazil, which is absolutely massive. It takes five hours, actually, to fly from Santiago to Rio. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. And the, here's Peru, where you have Machu Picchu. And the long, skinny country huddled between the South Pacific in the west and the Cordillera of the Andes in the east is Chile. To the north, this is the high Atacama, the highest and driest desert in the world. And to the south is the Strait of Magellan. Chile actually controls the Strait of Magellan, and I'm pretty sure they have a list of treaties um, about as long as this room <coughs> telling people, no, you can't just tell ships that can't go through the Strait of Magellan because you're pissed at Argentina. <coughs> Chile has a population of about 16 million. For comparison, this is about halfway between Illinois and New York in population. So it's a good-sized state. But the New York City metropolitan area has twice as many people as the entire nation of Chile. Their gross domestic product, and I looked this up on Wikipedia today, is a roughly equivalent to the state product of Connecticut, just to give you a sense of the scale both of their economy and of their population. And about half of their population lives in the capital city of Santiago, about 7 million people. This is an absolutely gorgeous image of Santiago. This was the morning after it poured rain all night, so it snowed beautifully in the Andes. You had snow-capped mountains ringing the city. It looks like that two days a year. It has, it has the same problem. How many people remember Los Angeles back in the 80s before all the smog, before all the car emissions requirements? Santiago's got the same problem. The mountains are just three times higher. So this happens about 10 times a year. So if you visit Santiago and you don't see beautiful snow-capped mountains, please don't yell at me. Um, they are a member of the US visa waiver program. Um, economically and politically, they are one of, if not the most stable country on the continent. And they are also the highest aspect ratio country in the world, from Arica in the north on the Peruvian border, which is up here, slightly off the edge of the image, Actually, displaying a map of Chile on a PowerPoint slide is remarkably difficult. Down to the tip of Tierra del Fuego in the south would stretch almost from New York to Los Angeles. At its widest point, it is 220 miles wide. So around Santiago, it's narrower than the state of Maryland, just to give you a sense. And um, to give you just a brief, gratuitous photograph, because again, I had a DSLR in Chile, I'm going to start by showing you some images of Patagonia, way down in the south here, then Los Lagos, which is the region up, which is here, 
and then jump straight up to the Atacama Desert in the north. And Santiago is right in the middle at about 33 degrees south, so it's equivalent in latitude to San Diego for us. In fact, the climate is very similar to that of Southern California. This is Patagonia. Um, everyone, if you've, if you've gone to Yellowstone or Yosemite and you go and you take the picture of Old Faithful, and you go to Yellowstone, Ye Yosemite and take a picture of El Capitan, and Yellowstone and take a picture of Old Faithful, this is the equivalent picture in Chile. This is Torres del Paine National Park. Um, and then this is the Fjord of Last Hope and the ice fields um, also in Patagonia. As you move further north, things get a little warmer and a little, gr and a little greener. This is Chiloé, an island off the coast, and this is Orsorno. This is an active shield volcano. It hasn't erupted in 200 years, which is a good thing. Um, in fact, I, I mean, I wouldn't have taken my parents up to about here if it was at all, there was a chance at all it was erupting. I like my parents. <laughs> However, Volcan Calbuco, this is the picture that I took in January 2015 from the resort town of uh, Puerto Varas. And this is basically from the exact same spot two months later. Um, Chile sits on the Nazca seismic zone. It is one of the most tectonically active countries in the world. In the last five years, they have had three eight-point-plus earthquakes. The most recent was just this past September. And to give you an example of just how good Chile is at handling this, we all run outside. Initially, we just think the, the, um, one of our Chilean friends is nuts because he comes sprinting out past us to go outdoors. We all run outside. The ground's kind of doing this, about three minutes. And um, I look around. Power didn't go out. We didn't lose internet. The metro shut down for about an hour. And the buses kept running. So in short, Chile handled an 8.3 earthquake better than Baltimore handled Snowzilla. <laughs> so when it, so, however, when it comes to building telescopes, the epicenter, Iquique and um, Iape, are both in the north. And in the 8.3 earthquake, they actually had to shut down, I believe it was Gemini, because it was shifted on its mount slightly. So this is that when they build the telescopes there, they do build them for these sorts of events. And last but not least is the Atacama Desert in the north. Um, this is salt lagoons. These are the salt flats. This year, a bit higher here. The peaks of these mountains, just to give you a sense of the scale of this, the peaks of those mountains are 6,000 meters high. Um, where I am standing here is at about 2,600 meters. So I'm already here roughly at the height of Kitt Peak. Here is, this is, is about 3,800. And yet the mountains are still rising thousands of meters above you. It was actually very difficult to capture the scale of this landscape in a photograph because this stretches as far as your eye can see to the south and to the north. And in the Atacama, in the clear air, you can see 300 miles to the south and 300 miles to the north. And there's a wall of mountains. In this photograph, you can't see it particularly well, but just over the back here, there's a tiny white dot, and just over the back, is the high site of the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. The, uh, this is the site of the best astronomy on the planet. So why Chile? I warned you there would be gratuitous photographs. The first, so you need a couple of things. When we try, talk about building a billion dollar telescope, because that's what, when we, talk, when we build these new telescopes, it is a billion dollars of investment. We need a couple of things. The first thing we need are dark skies. How many people have looked outside here and not been able to see the Big Dipper because the light pollution is so bad? And it's a good day if you can actually see six of the Pleiades, let alone the seven sisters. We live in this lovely little band of light that runs unbroken from Washington, D.C. to Boston. 
Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is run by NOAO, is here. Slightly better, but there's still a lot of issues with light pollution. The obvious solution, if things aren't working in the centers where people are, is that you move out to where people aren't. And what we've done up till now is, here's the big island of Hawaii, where Mauna Kea Observatory is, and the Canary Islands, where La Palma is located. So you build them on islands, usually volcanic islands, in the middle of the ocean. However, this is northern Chile, this big dark spot. There's not a lot of light pollution there. Remember, half the population of Chile lives right here. So outside the cities in the north of Chile, very, very few people, and therefore very, very little light. You also want to get up as high as you can. So when you look up, you see the stars twinkling. And that's because of movement of the atmosphere, turbulence of the air in, within our atmosphere. And the higher you can get up, the more atmosphere you get above, the less twinkle you're going to have. So you want to get as high. Now this is here. I'm at, this picture is taken at 4,200 meters. That's roughly the equivalent height of the summit of Mauna Kea. And again, the, these mountains are probably another 1,500 meters higher than that. Chile, I like to joke, goes from 0 to 20,000 feet in about 100 miles. This is, the, this is a little further north than the edge of the Chilean, um, northern Chilean border, but it's roughly the same. This is the Pacific Ocean. This is sea level. This is the Continental Divide. This is the width of Chile. So you go from the ocean, where it's relatively easy to get equipment, people, supplies, to observatory height very, very, very quickly. You also need a dry, stable climate. It can, in the middle of the Amazon, it is pitch black. And on the eastern side of the Andes, you're reasonably high. But it rains half the year. And generally, we don't open telescopes when it's cloudy or it's rainy. It tends to damage the mirrors. So you need a dry climate, and you need a stable climate. This is a picture of the Atacama Desert near San Pedro de, near San Pedro de Atacama. There are sections of this desert where rain, rainfall is not measured in inches per year. It is measured in centimeters per century. In fact, there are sections of this that are as arid as the surface of Mars. So pretty much most people would look at, unless you're a copper miner, you look at the Atacama and go, oh, God. Astronomers would like a second one in the northern hemisphere. The other thing you need, and this is again, there's, there's, the pictures aren't as pretty here because I don't go around taking pictures of infrastructure when you're traveling, but you do need a reasonably stable government country with good infrastructure. Um, An uh, example would, would be, again, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This is over $2 billion of investment. And there are sites in the Altiplano in Bolivia that are equivalent to the site where it was built in Chile, but you need roads to get your supplies there. You need a government that is stable, that is supportive, but is also stable politically and economically, because you don't want to put $2 billion into a telescope and then suddenly not be able to get there. And you also need to be able to run electric. You need to be able to run internet. You need to be able to, you know, all those fun things that generally make the world go round. Um, and Chile has all of these things. This is, an ex this is the south of Chile, about five hours south of Santiago, and this is the Atacama. These are both in the Atacama. And this is actually the Tropic of Capricorn. So behind me are the tropics, and above me, wait, no. Behind me, ahead of me are the tropics, and behind me is the temperate zone. The sun was in the wrong place. So the Atacama has all of these things. And Chileans know this. You go to a bar, you go to an Spanglish event, you say, I'm an astronomer. 
the first thing they say is, oh, so you work in the north. I get into a cab. Oh, what, what do you do? I'm an astronomer. Oh, do you work for Alma? This happened to me six times in cabs in Santiago. There is a very, very real awareness of the kind of astronomy that is going on in the Atacama. It's just I always tell them that astronomers like pisco sours and Peruvian foods, so we stay in Santiago. This is actually very close to Santiago, about an hour outside of it. But this is why. Um, I'm going to talk to you about six of the observatories in the north. There are others that are smaller, that maybe only have one telescope that's less than four meters. But if I were to list all of them, we would be here until the next snowstorm. And I'd like to get home and eat dinner. The first, the first one that was founded in 1962, it is turning 54 years old today, can almost apply for Medicare, is the Sierra Tololo Inter-American Observatory. And this is run by NOAO, the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, um, can, um, the Canadian government is in conjunction with Chile. The nearest city is the port city of La Serena. This is about a seven hour bus ride or 45 minute flight north of Santiago. And it's an, at an altitude of about 7,200 feet, um, for those that don't think in metric. When I list the telescopes at each of these observatories, I'm only going to mention by name those that are more than four meters. Because again, I would like to get everybody out of here before midnight. On Sierra Tololo is the four meter Blanco telescope, which is currently hosting the Dark Energy Survey. Um, and the ultrafaint dwarves that Tom Brown works on and, talk, and um, is going to talk about in a couple of months. 13 new candidates have been found with the Dark Energy Survey in the last year. Sloan found 16 in total. So this is actually one of the really exciting and somewhat unexpected results that has come out of the dark energy, ca um, the dark energy camera on the Blanco telescope. There's also the 4.1 meter SOAR telescope and 18 smaller telescopes. I'd like to point out six of these are more than a meter in diameter. This is small in Chile. And for if any of you ever find yourselves um, near La Serena for a vacation, public tours actually are available for Sierra Tololo. It is the only professional observatory in Chile other than Alma that will allow you to do a tour. You just need to sign up a little bit in advance. But there actually are tourist observatories as well. So um, astronomy tourism is actually an industry for this area. Then we have La Silla, which is run by the European Southern Observatory in conjunction with the Max Planck Institute and, some, and a few European governments. It's about two years younger than Sierra Tololo, also near La Serena and a hair higher at 7,900 feet. It has nine smaller telescopes, the, the largest of which is about 3.5 meters. Nearby on Cerro Pachon, and we're going, to be, we're going to be coming back to Cerro Pachon in a little bit, is Gemini South. This is run by the Associ Astronomy University Research Association in the United States with its international partners. This is the twin of Gemini North, which sits on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's an eight, and it is an 8.1 meter telescope at nearly 9,000 feet. And to give you a sense, this is when some people are going to start to feel altitude, when you get up at, at these levels. So again, same part of Chile. You still fly into La Serena. It's just a little bit of a longer car ride, is the Las Campanas Observatory run by the Carnegie Institution. And this has the two 6.5 meter Magellan telescopes, which you can see here. With the, this is the southern Milky Way arching over. This big dark cloud in the middle there, that is the galactic center. Somebody once pointed out to me that if all of the scientists working in the north 300 years ago had had this view instead of the one that we see, we would have figured out we were in a disk a lot sooner. <laughs> the small blob here is not a cloud. That is a large Magellanic cloud the largest dwarf regular galaxy around the Milky Way, and in dark skies it is visible to the easily visible by the naked eye. 
in the southern hemisphere, along with the SMC, which is just below it. Oh yeah, and there's three smaller telescopes. Now we're moving, we're jumping north. So instead of it being an hour flight from Santiago, you're now flying three hours to Antofagasta. This is near where those pictures I showed you in the Atacama are. This is Paranal Observatory. This is run by ESO, and it's about 8,600 feet up. It has the 4-meter VISTA telescope and 17 smaller telescopes, again, the all of which are more than a meter in diameter. And it also has the four 8.2-meter very large telescopes. Two of these telescopes have adaptive optics, which is a way to use laser guide stars, lasers, to basically take the twinkle and the wiggle out of the stars. In ideal scene conditions, with the adaptive optics turned on, the VLT has resolution equivalent to the Hubble Space Telescope. And with one very, very decided advantage. You can change out instruments a lot easier on the VLT than you can on the Hubble. And when you put the wrong mirror in, it's a little easier to fix. In addition to each of the, of the 8.2 meter telescopes being absolutely fantastic instruments in their own right, they can be linked up either two, three, or all four as the most powerful optical interferometer in the world. When all four telescopes are working as an interferometer, this is the most powerful optical telescope currently in existence in the world. And last, but certainly not least, is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. Um, ALMA happens to also be the Spanish word for soul, which I'm sure had nothing to do with the acronym. This is run by the United States, Europe, Canada, Japan, and Chile. It saw first light in 2001, and 2011, rather, and they have just finished the commissioning. The nearest city is San Pedro de Atacama, and unlike all of these other observatories where you could go up to the observatory and you would probably be completely fine, the high site of Alma is at 5,000 meters. This is almost 17,000 feet. This is a roughly base camp of Mount Everest, is what you were talking about. They have a visitor center that's at lower elevation that is a little safer. If you're okay in San Pedro, you'll, you'll be okay at the visitor center. But to go up to the high site, you have to pass health checks. If you don't pass the health checks, you are not going to the high site. And this includes astronomers. This is everybody. Um, it is made up of 66 millimeter wavelength dishes. And if you remember that lovely image of the pillars in the Carina Nebula, where you saw the infrared versus the optical, millimeter wavelengths are able to pass through all of that dust that look dark in the visible. And it allows us to see into stellar nurseries. It allows us to see gas in the very, very early epoch of the universe and see areas of star formation in the, in the you know, 12 and a half billion years ago. And one of the most spectacular, there's been incredible spectacular science coming out of Alma, but the one that made, I think, every single astronomer in my institute drop their, I mean, we thought this was actually a model, is this image. This is an image. This is not a model. This is not a computer generated anything. This is a picture of a disk, of a protoplanetary disk of a forming solar system around another star. This isn't a model. The dark lines that you see here are the tracks carved out by forming planets. Again, this is a picture. When this initially showed up on my Facebook feed, I skipped over it because I thought, oh, someone's showing a nice picture of a model of a protoplanetary disk. This is an image. And this is Alma. And it does actually snow up there. And so th that's what Chile has now. But, you know, six observatories, a couple of other extra ones, five institutes in the capital city, you know, that's 
wonderful and fantastic, but we need the next, we need a bigger telescope. We need, we always want the next big telescope. We always want the next major piece of equipment. So first on the docket is the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, or the LSST. This will be on Sarah Pachon. First light will be in 2019, and it will be an 8.4 meter telescope, so nothing horribly spectacular. This is about the same size as each of the VLT telescopes. But its field of view will be 3.5 degrees across. That's seven full moons across in one shot. Each image that it takes will be 3.2 gigapixels. So a thousand times what you have in your camera, in your iPhone camera. Same kind of technology, just bigger. Uh, the CCD, the imaging um, for this, is going to be about the size of a coffee table. <laughs> and it will image the entire night sky every three days. And, is an, and this is an artist's conception. This is nowhere near built, but this is an artist's conception of what the VLT will look like. And, as an ex and just to sort of show you the kind of support that astronomy enjoys in Chile, the Chilean president came to the first stone ceremony for the LSST. Um, this is, and the previous president came to the commissioning of ALMA. The United States, I think, sent the director of, N of the NSF. Next up, um, also same area, is the Giant Magellan Telescope. This will be built at Las Campanas Observatory. And it is going to be a 25.5 meter telescope. I did not put that decimal point in the wrong place. This is a 25.5 meter telescope. It will have 10 times the resolving power of HST. And it's made of, you can see here, it's made of seven eight meter segments. And they basically are, have cut off the top of a mountain to allow for the complex. And just in case 25.5 meters wasn't big enough for you, this is the European Extremely Large Telescope. And astronomers are immensely creative at naming things. Um, this will be built at Paranal. And first light will not be until 2024. But it will be 39.3 meters. This will be a 40 meter telescope. And to give you a sense of the scale, these are the eight meter telescopes for the VLT. This is the Coliseum. This is the EELT. It will be the largest telescope on the planet and will have 16 times the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope. So what does Chile get for this? They provide the infrastructure. In the case of, I believe it is the EELT, there is a mining moratorium within 50 miles of it to prevent dust from being kicked up in the atmosphere. And mining is one of the two major drivers of the Chilean economy. So they are doing what they can to make it useful and helpful for astronomers. Many of the operators at the telescopes are Chilean. Many of the people that are doing the facilities support for the telescopes are also Chileans. So it is jobs for Chileans, and often in areas where there aren't many jobs otherwise. However, scientifically, they get an additional boon. For all the science that everybody wants to do, we don't have enough hours on telescopes. Like that, like that wonderful mosaic of the Carina Nebula. That's a huge amount of Hubble time. And not everybody gets the huge amount of time that they want to do the kind of science that they want to do. So telescope time is currency in astronomy. And access to telescope time can allow you to do science you could only dream of otherwise. 10% of the science time on every single telescope I just showed you goes to Chilean institutions in exchange for the infrastructure support and for allowing these telescopes to be built on their soil. And this allows you to do some science that you wouldn't otherwise even be able to dream of doing 
unless you had access to what is referred to in the field as the CNTAC, the Chilean National Telescope Allocation. And I am a theorist. I was trained on computers. Last time I went to a telescope, it, there was a massive thunderstorm. And it wasn't monsoon season. And I am a co-I on a major survey on the dark energy survey camera. And the science behind it is very, very simple. This is our local galaxy group. This is the Milky Way and Andromeda, or right at the center of this image. Down here we have, and they are both about, they're both about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So we'll just call that one Milky Way. This is Fornax. That's about 100 Milky Ways in mass. This is the Virgo cluster. It's about 1,000 Milky Ways in mass. It's the nearest large cluster to our galaxy. And these are all of the nearby galaxy groups. And all of this is within about 30 million light years of us. So this is very much our, when we talk about galaxy formation and galaxy evolution, this is the neighborhood. This is, this is our neighborhood. You can go down and ask somebody to borrow for some eggs if we needed to. So the problem is that to do, it's great, they're nearby. We can see all sorts of awesome details. We could even see an Eta Car twin if we wanted to. In fact, these are closer than the galaxies where the Eta Car twins were. But because they are close, it means they are big on the sky. So if you want to be able to look at a galaxy and all of its surroundings, you need to do a massive mosaic. And that is a lot of telescope time. We chose to focus on a galaxy named Centaurus A. It's about 9 million light years from our Milky Way. And it's about 10 times the Milky Way in mass. So it's not quite a cluster, but it is bigger than the Milky Way. And unlike Andromeda in the Milky Way or the Whirlpool Galaxy, which are these beautiful spirals, Centaurus A is an elliptical galaxy. So it doesn't have the beautiful spiral arms. It's just a large spheroid that we think underwent a major collision, two galaxies slamming into each other about a billion or two years ago. So you would think we would know a huge amount about Centaurus A and its dwarf galaxies. We know of 11 of them. There has been no systematic survey of Centaurus A ever done. And to give you an example of what these kind of systematic surveys can do, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Panda Survey of Andromeda doubled the census of local group dwarf galaxies in five years. In the last year, the Dark Energy Survey added another 13 galaxies to the survey. So these are the kind of discoveries that literally fall out of the woodwork when you do these sorts of surveys. But, you know, can you say 10% of the time on deck cam? This is, each of these pointings is deck cam. Each of these, each of these is two degrees across. That's four full moons. This, the distance across the entire environment of Centaurus A is the same as the distance between the Milky Way and Andromeda. 2.5 million light years. The image of the galaxy that I showed you, that beautiful picture of Centaurus A, is a tiny little dot in the center of this. And in total, this is 70 square degrees. And this is the um, first time this has ever been done for all of Centaurus A. And we named it SCABS, a survey of Centaurus A's baryonic structure. And part of my job, the running joke whenever I talk to astronomers about my work in Chile is, yes, Virginia, there is theory in Chile is to run simulations so that I can tell the observers, this is what we should see. Because you're not going to 
even with access to the Chilean telescope time, you are not going to spend that much deck cam time if you're not going to see anything. You're the even you're you're going to get thrown out. No one's they're going to say why are you even looking? This is a simulation of Centaurus A. The big red thing in the center is Sene. All of the points that you see are satellite galaxies of Sene. In general, the bigger it is, the more massive it is, and the brighter it is going to be, and the easier it is going to be detect, to detect for our survey. Depending on how stars form, depending on how deep our survey is actually able to go, there are going to be hundreds, if not possibly thousands, of dwarves that will be discovered in the SCABS data. And we've already detected about 12. And that's in the first tile. That's in that, if you remember that here, that's here. And some of these objects are going to be ancient. So you're here looking at how bright a galaxy is and how extended. The blue, the green here, are ancient galaxies. Galaxies that formed stars 13 billion years ago and have done nothing since. You can think of them as dinosaur bones of galaxy evolution. And we can use them the exact same way paleontologists figured out what a T-Rex looks like. We can use these galaxies to figure out what the very first galaxies looked like. We've done it for the Milky Way. I mean, we've done it for Andromeda. And the survey that we've been what we've done in, that has been done in Chile will allow us to do it for a galaxy outside the local group, beyond our Milky Way, for the very, very first time. And other, among other things, you know, because you know you need always need more data. The same thing has been done for Fornax and for Virgo. So this is the kind of science you can do when you have access to that kind of telescope time. And this is science that can only be done with access to the Chilean TAC and only can be done in Chile. So any questions? How much telescope time is it going to take to cover all this? It took two days. Two nights. We had to go back later because we had some weather issues on one of the tiles, but yeah, tonight. I think they were talking about using Centaur say, as a uh, radio star point for uh, calibrating a space track radar at one time. Apparently, it's it's very bright as far it's bright enough that the uh, uh, radar frequencies can be picked up from it. There, have a, there is an, um, a black hole, an accretion black hole, that's shooting radio jets off in the center of the main galaxy. And that would definitely be bright enough to do something like that. Sorry. If these uh, various devices are being constructed in a very dry, high climate, um, what is done regarding water? Is it trucked in, or are there wells? or It's whatever? trucked in. Um, there was there was one time when I forget whether it was I believe it was snow blocked the road, so the people that were up I had a friend whose sister was up at La Silla and they couldn't shower for three days, <laughs> so it is trucked in, it's trucked in, and the, you are given very very strict instructions, as far as um, how long you can take a shower for. <laughs> You, you inferred that uh, some of these telescopes are cost billions of dollars. Who's providing the funding? Where is it called, um, coming from? Alma came from the National Science Foundation, um, various universities, as well as the governments of Canada, Japan, various governments in Europe, and some funding as well came from Chile. So when you talk about a telescope, I, th I believe it is GMT is going to, I think ELT is a billion. <coughs> Um, when you talk about these, very rarely is it a single institution. 
It is often, just like with the large space operations like HST or JWST, it is a consortium of multiple organizations that are pooling their resources to build these, these very large facilities. Is the relationship between Chile and Peru an intention? <coughs> I'm pleading the fifth on that. <laughs> Let me put it this way. After a certain Hague ruling, um, one of my friends showed up for dinner wearing a shirt that said, the sea will always be Chilean. So there's, in, it's, uh, they're not actively shooting at each other right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's always a little bit of, there's always a little bit of tension. In fact, um, half of, um, the nor of northern Chile was Peruvian until about 120 years ago. Sea We have a question in the middle. This is a, you have people working at seventeen thousand feet, roughly. How do you get any work done in there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, people, are people using auxiliary oxygen? They're in the rooms where you're staying when you're up there are pressurized oh. and oxygenated. Um, and then when you have to go outside, you basically go out, you do what you have to do, and then you come back in after a few hours, but you then pretty much sleep for the rest of the day. I mean, even at um, 4,200, um, so 800 meters below that, I was beginning to feel it. So, no, you are on, if you're out for any length of time, you're on, you have a tank on your back with. Yeah. So, okay. Do you hire Sherpas? No. <laughs> no, they, they don't, there's no budget for Sherpas. <laughs> <laughs> the astronomers carry their own supplemental. <laughs> How does the resolution of the big interferometry array compare to the proposed resolution of these other big telescopes that are going to be there? Alma, if I remember correctly, because I am not a radio astronomer, if I remember correctly, Alma is resolving... Not the radio, the, uh, the, the, optical, the optical interferometry. VLT is roughly equivalent to Hubble right now. On its best days, the very large telescope, the optical interferometer, can roughly equate to Hubble in resolution. The new telescopes are going to be 10 or 20 times better than that, but they won't come online for another 10 years. Those are the individual telescopes, right? Each of the individual telescopes is about the same. It's what about as an interferometer where you get more resolution? You get more resolution, but you, if you had adaptive optics on all four years. You don't have this ability to remove the wiggle of the stars. That's only on two of the four mirrors. And getting that, those kind of conditions is only possible in the absolutely best conditions, um, which you get, you get, but you don't get that often. But, it is, but if you cook the interferometer together, you are going to have a better chance at achieving that kind of a resolution. You have questions up there? Um, I appreciate that northern Chile is a great place for an observatory. But you mentioned early in your talk that something like 70% of the infrastructure in astronomy is going to be based there. Is anyone concerned that that's just too high a concentration? Uh, especially if you want to track something for, say, 20 or 30 hours continuously, the Earth unfortunately rotates, meaning that if all your telescopes are in one location, you have a problem. It's, if you can find me, an equivalent to the Atacama Desert that is about 180 degrees around. <laughs> um, I guess what I'm asking is, uh, is anyone concerned that maybe um, a less ideal site could be chosen just in the interest of getting some geographic diversity for it? For us. radio, that has been done. <coughs> for radio, that's been done. That's the Very Long Baseline Array, which actually stretches worldwide. For optical, it's not as much of a concern. You just kind of go back and you keep hitting targets. The solution, if you need more integration time for an optical, is to build a 25 meter telescope. That's been, that's sort of the solution for the optical. We just build a bigger telescope. Um, way in the corner there. Um, you know, the most beautiful sky I've seen to, with the naked eye is in like southern Idaho at night in the desert away from Idaho Falls of Pocatello. Just in your opinion, how would you compare the sky to the naked eye there to maybe like in southern Idaho? If you've ever been to southern Idaho or I've Colorado? been to Apache Point Observatory okay. where the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was done on a moonless night. Um, and that for the northern hemisphere is the most spectacular sky I've ever seen. 
I think that the sky, just by naked eye, is actually more spectacular in the south, and that's because in the northern hemisphere, we're looking towards the edge of our galaxy. So there's less stuff. There's fewer stars, fewer nebula. And you also don't have the Magellanic clouds, these dwarf irregular galaxies. Whereas when you're in the south, you're looking towards the center of the galaxy, and the Milky Way itself is, it's, the Milky Way is gorgeous in the north, but it's to me, once you've seen it in the south, the Milky Way in the north is sort of, looks like this sort of puny, almost puny thing. So I would, I would have to say in equivalent skies, I think the southern hemisphere wins for spectacular naked eye sky. One more little question. Uh, with James Webb coming online, is there going to be like a competition to, for information? It seems like there will be a lot of information out there in the next, you know, five or seven years. Um, could you like compare, you know, what's, you know, the competition, I mean, between astronomers, between those different, you know, telescopes? Because you showed a lot of, a lot of them coming online down there, but I know James Webb is coming online too. James Webb is doing something fundamentally different. Okay. The Large Synaptic Survey Telescope, the LSST, is designed to do the entire sky over and over again. Um, how many people have heard about the new planet that they think they've detected? Um, that, may, that can be seen with LSST because you don't know exactly where it is and you need to go deep over a large area of the sky. The EELT and the GMT are going to be primarily optical telescopes. Uh, James Webb is working in the infrared. And so you don't want to build all of your telescopes working on one thing because you want to be able to cover all different fields of view and all different wavelengths. So there's always some competition, but... But let me just interject here that your comment is very um, important in that there's a data explosion coming in astronomy in the next decade. Because DE cam is already 580 million pixels. Right? Don't even get me started. Right. DE cam is, five, is already over 500 million pixels. So we got 3.2 gigapixels per image coming up. Um, w first is coming online. That will have when that goes up. That'll be 2.4 gigapixels per image. Um, we are going to have you know not just gigabytes, not just terabytes. We'll get petabytes of data that we have to analyze. Okay, so astronomy. Is going is really going to be part of a data science. We're doing a lot of work in astronomy to train people how to pull information out of these very large mounds of data. I mean, when she said that you know LSST is going to survey the sky every three days, right? It's going to do it every three days continuously for a decade. Okay, that's how much data it's going to get. All right, there's just an awful lot. Uh, like the um, particle physicists who. Who, um, who are swamped in data currently. Astronomers are going to be swamped in data, and so a lot of us, we need a lot of good computer science pe people to, to get into astronomy, I'll say that. And we okay. need a better internet connection to some people. <laughs> <laughs> we always need a better internet connection. No, you, you always need a better internet connection, but right now there is one cable connecting Santiago to the rest of the world. Mm. Um, okay. And that, you know, so it would be really nice if there could be maybe another one. <laughs> <laughs> Except the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's actually a problem. Um, it, in Santiago to the Northern Hemisphere, your download speeds, unless you're on a dedicated connection, were one megabyte per second. If I did this, sacrificed, uh, you know, you know, sacrificed my firstborn child and, you know, did a rain dance, and then I might get one megabyte per second. And so that's actually a huge challenge for some of these observatories is with this kind of data, how do you even get that data to where the majority of the astronomers are working, which is in the Northern Hemisphere? All right, so we have a question from the online audience. Um, they were talking about uh, Atacama being the driest place on Earth, is what it's called, but yet there was some news of floods there. Do you know anything about that? Actually? That was a once in a hundred year event. Okay. Um, and the rainfall actually would be, was equivalent to what Maryland would get in a really rainy weekend in the summer. So it's the kind of rainfall that Maryland handles very easily, but Maryland is set up to handle it. Um, Antofagasta was not. So, so we can't handle snow, but... The we can handle rain, but the Atacama <laughs> can't handle rain. So, you know, it's, they can handle earthquakes, but they can't handle rain. They're just not set up. Um, it resulted in what's called <coughs> the green of the Atacama, which happens very, very rarely. And a friend of mine her, she unfortunately had to come back to Santiago, but her grandmother 
had never seen it. So like they went out into the desert and the Atacama blooms, which if you can imagine this incredibly dry desert just covered in flowers. And it had not happened in living memory. So it's... I think that qualifies as rare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have a question in the back? Yes. For Northern Hemisphere targets, what would be the best site to build a telescope? If, pardon? Northern, Northern Hemisphere targets. targets. You need dark, so that knocks out the most of the United States. You need dry. I mean, the best site remains probably La Palma or Mauna Kea. <coughs> Just because you need um, some of the sites in Asia that might work don't have the kind of infrastructure access that you would need to build these sorts of telescopes. So it. I'm, I am not an expert at all in where to build telescopes, but off the top of my head, I would still say you want to look for a volcanic island in the middle of the ocean. All right, question down here. Um, to uh, safeguard your health, are you limited in how long you are allowed to operate at that elevation? For Alma or for the lower telescopes? When we're talking 5,000 meters, 6,000 meters? You're in a, you're in, the majority of the time you're in a pressurized, oxygenated kind of trail. So when you're in that, you're, it's like you're at a lower elevation. You sort of go out until you feel sick and then you come back in. <laughs> um, I, and the thing is, someone has to go out on each of those dishes for Alma. There are plates, hexagonal plates. And they have to be precisely calibrated for the curve of the telescope. And some astronomer, when I say astronomer, I mean graduate student, <laughs> has to go out with a screwdriver and manually adjust each of those plates so that you get the curve of the dish. Oh, goodness. Um, when they were building the telescope and they had people out there for a long time, they had oxygen. They actually were carrying oxygen with them. And if you've lived most of your life at those elevations, the same, the same way that the Sherpas um, in the Himalayas, you can handle those altitudes a little bit better. But there are limits. Like you, if you're going to work at the high site, you go work a week at the high site, and then you come down. So like you don't go up for months and months at a time. Um, but it, again, it's dependent on health. I, there were people that went up, a group of astronomers that wanted to go up. Two of them were not allowed to go up because their health checks did not pass. And they were not going to allow them to go up to 5,000 meters. So they were turned away at the and visitor center. There are stories all amongst the astronomy community of astronomers at the high sites of, of telescopes unable to do basic mathematics, OK? Um, because they, they're, they're, they just, by the end of the night, they're, 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 you're not able to focus as well, all right? So I mean, and that's not at these levels. This is, you know. Mauna Kea type levels. There, so. I know of someone at Mauna Kea that had been working at Mauna Kea at, uh, at the high point of Mauna Kea for a decade and then all of a sudden one day they couldn't handle the altitude anymore yeah. and he can't go up like it's, it's not there's there's nothing you can do he just can't handle the <coughs> altitude anymore and he can no longer go up to the summit. Okay question here. Did I speak uh, Portuguese? There. Spanish. In Spanish, in Argentina, Portuguese. Spanish. And let me just say that there are a lot of Spanish speakers, it looks like. I can't quite read it. On, online watching, by the way. Oh, God, so I should have given that you're doing, uh, fact that you're doing <laughs> astronomy in Chile seems to have attracted some Chilean um, viewers oh, on YouTube, okay? Hey, guys. Hey, guys. If I jump back to your, your review of the monthly news, okay. was there any more uh, to be said about Planet Nine that hasn't there been? Any more news? Oh, I didn't do Planet Nine today. Okay, yeah. Well, I got off on the on the Groundhog Day thing. Um, so just to make sure everybody knows, um, there was an announcement from I guess uh, Caltech, right? It was from Caltech. Mike Brown and collaborator. I know Mike Brown from graduate school, so I can't remember his collaborator's name. Um, <laughs> although his collaborator did most of the work. Um, they have noted that there are 13 Kuiper Belt objects that have unusual orbits. And what's unusual about their orbits is they all seem to have the same um, uh, perihelion point 
Okay, that uh, doesn't seem to, 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 and they're wondering what makes these objects all have these similar similarity in their orbit, okay? And so these, Mike's collaborator ran simulation after simulation after simulation and said that could be caused if there was a 20 Earth mass planet out at about 600 astronomical units, 500, 600 astronomical units out, okay? So Earth is at one AU, uh, Neptune is at 30 AU. This would be 20 times larger at 600 AU, okay? Now, there's no reason that this couldn't be true, okay? Because we wouldn't have seen it. It's just too small and too faint, and you know, you really have, would have to be looking for it. But it's a computer simulation that indicates that these eccentric, these, uh, these 13 orbits could be explained by a 20 Earth mass planet out there, all right? Have we seen it? No. How does the computer model say, hey, it's a good probability? Yes, okay? Um, and what Mike was doing by announcing it uh, was not saying we found planet nine. He was being, well, Mike has a sense of humor. Let me say that, okay? He's <laughs> always had a sense of humor. Um, and he's tweaking everybody by calling it planet nine because he was part of the, of, of the reason that you know, Pluto is no longer considered a planet. Um, and he also wanted to get enough attention so that other astronomers would go out and look for it. And uh, as you said, it's going to take one of these large field uh, 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 telescopes to do it. Um, here we're working with the WFIRST team, the Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope, which, uh, it, uh, which, which is a survey telescope which would be able to um, do a search for this uh, putative planet 9. Although I think LSST will be online before WFIRST. So. Um, there are a bunch of, of, of these large field surveys that m might be able to find it. It'll be very small, very faint, um, it'll be in the infrared is where you'll find it. Okay, So we'll find out sometime in the next decade or two whether or not it truly exists. Right? Is it, yes. any, is it anywhere near the New Horizons ship at the moment? New Horizons is 30 AU out there, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, it took a decade to go 30, uh, 30 AU. How many, uh, how, many, how many decades is it going to take to go 600 AU, okay? <laughs> um, and it's almost, assuredly, it's almost assuredly not in the right direction, unfortunately. Because <laughs> right, it's, to quote the, the main movie Arm Armageddon, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but it's a big-ass sky out there. One thing they got right in Armageddon. One thing they got right. All right, there's one last question I saw. Right there, yeah. I'm surprised what you're saying about the, uh, not about the data flow from Santiago, but I had just assumed that every one of these sites would have a ComSat link. Yeah, but you still have to run a physical cable. You still have to somehow get a physical cable, and they have dedicated portions. So if you can imagine, there's a certain bandwidth coming from Chile into the rest of the into the rest of the world. I'm surprised that each of these telescopes. They have, they have dedicated links. They do have dedicated links. But when you're talking about 3.2 gigapixels per image, the entire night sky every three days for 10 years, you're going to need more than a dedicated part of one fiber optic cable running under the Pacific Ocean. You're going to need, there's going to need to be some additional bandwidth. No, you won't, won't get it through the communication satellites. Mm, nowhere near. Okay. Um, one of the things that's been discussed is to try to do a lot of as much analysis as possible on the fly. So that you can somehow compress the data down into smaller formats. But if somebody then goes in, for instance, with DeckCam, that was initially done, and it turned out that the algorithms that they were using weren't accounting fully for the for issues in the detector. And so and you want the raw data. That you want, sure, you want the raw data. You want the raw data, yeah, but keep the level zero. you know, you gotta keep the level zero, but at the same time, you don't want it to take three days to download. <laughs> one, and that has happened. I have sent something downloading on Friday and come back Monday and it wasn't done yet. Um, so no, it's a, it's going to be an issue. All right. So if you would like to do astronomical tourism, what country are you going to visit? <laughs> there you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's see. Next month, March 1st, um, and we have John Debs. Uh, talking about uh, planets that survive the death of their host star. Let's give one last round of applause. <laughs>
redshift universe images of the uh, distant galaxies. It's basically the Hubble Ultra Deep Field version 3.5 or something like that. Okay? Um, if you didn't get one, get one after the lecture. Our speaker tonight is Mia Bowles. She is talking about the Southern Skies Astronomy in Chile. All right. Uh, and coming up, we have uh, next month, March 1st, John Debs will be talking about planetary tales from the stellar crypt, exoplanets surviving the death of their host star. So the idea that when a star dies, could the planet still be around? Yes, he will tell you all about those morbid tales next month. Uh, in April, Rachel Austin will be here and tell us why we need to understand uh, stars to find the next Earth, because the formation of stars and planets are intricately, intricately connected. So understanding one and understanding the other are actually trying to understand both at the same time. In May, Tom Brown, a gentleman who I, I guilted into coming back because he's a really good speaker, but he hadn't given a talk here in about a decade. Um, and I was able to get him to come back and talk about ultra faint dwarf galaxies, which he gave me a really long title, <coughs> The Trail of the Missing Galaxies, the Oldest Stars in the Neighborhood. Okay, so these are the ultra faint dwarf galaxies. He'll be telling us about those in May. If you would like to figure out, uh, oh, wait a minute, um, and about these upcoming talks, <coughs> you have an extremely important note. Now, how many of you people saw the road signs on the way here saying that San Martin Drive will be closed on or about uh, uh, February 12th? Yes, it, San Martin Drive, part of it will be closed. So south of the space of the Institute will be closed. So if you are going to come to next month and for the next like five or six months, I think it's through September, uh, you will have to approach from the north, which is from <coughs> University Parkway. If you try and approach from Wyman Park Drive and south, you won't be able to get here. It will be closed, okay? so. Make note, and next month, remember, tie a little string around your finger so you remember to come from the north. All right, so furthermore, if you want more information, you go to our website, which has been slightly revamped. I don't know if you, how, how many of you paid close attention to my, my slides, my opening slides, but this is slightly revamped because we have um, our, our, our page where we have our upcoming talks. These are uh, upcoming talks. We've also got links to the live, um, the YouTube event and the uh, STSAI webcasting. We've got the archives, the links for the archives put up much easier to find now, okay? You don't have to go one way or the other. You can find the, both YouTube and the STI webcasting. And if you would like to sign up for our email list, instead of having to do multiple steps with maillist.stsai.edu, we actually have a nice little box here where you can subscribe or unsubscribe right there, okay? so. Hey, we did something in January. We revamped our web page a little bit. Uh, all that information is there. Uh, to find it, just search Hubble Public Talks and you will find us. Or we have this Go link, hubblesite.org, Go Talks. All right, if you would like announcements, I just showed you how to sign up for the announcements list. If you want to do it the more difficult way, you can also go to maillist.stsci.edu. The uh, mail list is called Public Lecture Announce. Um, or just provide your email address. If you still want to go analog, you can write it down on a piece of paper, images we've ever released into the screen of you, but it actually contains a lot of other images that we've also released, okay? So we'll start right here. That object right there is Ada Carr, um, and Ada Carr, uh, we've been observing since the 1990s. It is a supermassive star. It's about 150 solar masses. Um, and this is one of the uh, star that we believe will, will explode in the next few million years. Okay, It's one of the stars that has this uh, a tremendous outburst of, of material that uh, was believed to have been thrown out in the 1840s. All right? uh, it had tremendous brightening and, and, and dimming. I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, of Eta Carr. So Eta Carr is one of the highlights of the Carina Nebula. Um, but if we also look here, in this region here, um, in 2000, we released this image of that region of, of the Carina Nebula, uh, in which, where we've got this beautiful um, 
bright uh, striation of, of gas here, as well as this dark gas here that's being eaten away. Uh, the, the wonderful colors in what is uh, sometimes called a keyhole nebula, as well as being called Carina. <coughs> and then if you look up here in this region here, in 2003, I believe it was, we released this image of these dust clouds. These dust clouds, this is actually dust in the wind, dust that's being pushed away by the wind from, a, from Ada Carr. The wind from Ada Carr is actually pushing, and, and so there is a dust flowing through the gas. Uh, that was one of our Hubble Heritage releases in 2003. Uh, and then this region over here got the royal treatment in 2010 because it was our 20th anniversary image, which we called Mystic Mountain. All right, uh, this is an inc incredible image uh, that we released for Hubble's 20th day over and over. And that day, of course, happens to be Groundhog Day. And he lives the thing, and it's a wonderful, I find it a very, very funny, a wonderful expression of life uh, and the the patterns of life that repeat, and he gets to live the same day over and over again. And it features the only scene, cinematic scene I know of a groundhog driving, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Not only does he see his shadow, he sees the shadow of death in this scene, if you know the movie. All right, so we are going to do our own Groundhog Day version where we're gonna do something over and over again with the Carina Nebula, all right? So this is a ground-based image of the Carina Nebula from the Anglo-Australian Observatory. And you can see the full scale of the Carina Nebula. It's a star-forming region. Uh, Hubble did a very large mosaic right here in this region of the, uh, of the Carina Nebula. And if I go in and I show you, these are all the footprints of the Hubble observations of the Carina Nebula, okay? And you can see there's like 40 different observations taken with Hubble. And I don't know if you guys recognize that, you know, it's hard enough just to get one or two or three observations, but 40 observations, okay? That's a lot of Hubble time, okay? So this, this was a, a significant chunk of Hubble observing time. And when you process that data, put it all together, you get an amazing image. This is the Carina Nebula mosaic, okay? Um, and uh, it was released in April 2007. And you'll note here it's 29,000 by 14,000. It is 400 megapixels of Carina Nebula goodness here, okay? And it just is one thing that I've noticed is that we, we can really milk uh, the Carina Nebula for all sorts of really interesting images. So this is the biggest, one of the biggest, and hand it to me and hope that I remember when I get in tomorrow to add you to the mail list, okay? Uh, it hasn't always worked. I will be honest with you that sometimes those pieces of paper don't always make it through. But fortunately, those people have come back to me and said, come on, Frank, and I've gotten it the next time. All right, uh, if you would also like to make any comments, you can uh, send things to publiclecture at stsci.edu. Uh, comments, questions, <coughs> sign up for announcements yet again. Another way to do that. Okay. If you'd like to follow us on social media, Hubble is on Facebook. We've got one, not one, but two Twitter accounts. Um, we're on Google+, and we're on Pinterest, and we may be on other things that I don't know about. Uh, myself, I have my blog on Hubble site and Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter that I use sparingly, okay? So uh, don't expect you're going to get lots of information if you try to follow me. I will post at most once a day. Okay. All right. Uh, the weather has not permitted us to open up the observatory to across the street or actually the Maryland Space Grand Observatory <laughs> folks. Uh, Duncan sent me an email and said it looks cloudy and I looked before I came in and it really is cloudy. So. So no observatory tonight, but go to md.spacegrant.org and you will find out when they have their other uh, open nights, which I believe is every Friday. So you can see, um, go and look through their observe telescope there. All right. Now we have our news from the universe for February 2016. And because it is a special day, you get Groundhog Day, Carina Nebula edition. Now, what am I referring to? I'm referring to the film starring Bill Murray and Andy McDowell from about 20 years ago, uh, in which Bill Murray is stuck reliving the same.